Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. To, um, to introduce myself and ask everyone else in person to introduce uh, themselves. Um, so my name is Juan. My name is Cass. Ron. Jeff. Paul. Tony. Stephen. Jack. I'm Brian. I'm Susan. Greg. I'm Kay. Stephen. Um, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, uh, not, not only, well, because he's a dear friend and also my, my Zen teacher. Um, Stephen Turney is a professor emeritus of counseling psychology at CIS. Um, Stephen began his Buddhist practice in 1993 and is now an ordained priest in the Soto Zen lineage of Suzuki Roshi. Um, and on a, on a personal note, I just like to say that um, I, these days I, I feel like um, I struggle a lot with um, humor in my life because I feel there's so much tension in the world right now and so much trauma that it, I never know, like, I, I feel like that's a very big struggle for me on like how to become like, authentic and bring humor to my, um, to my life and I, I'm just really inspired by, by um, Stephen who is very funny and at the same time makes me feel like a um, I can become a better person too. So, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. So, it's a pleasure to be at GBF always. It's a pleasure to be anywhere in person um, with other live human beings. Um, I happen to have been in this room all day yesterday for the 20th anniversary retreat of the LGBTQA Sangha. Um, so that was good. Um, but I've also had the pleasure of being at the Gay Buddhist Fellowship um, during Pride season a couple of times in the past 10 years. Um, and so that's always a, a very um, special, special time for me um, as, as a gay man, as a member of the LGBTQA community, um, and as a gay Buddhist. I think it's, um, it's just a really special time. So I think it's an opportunity for us, all of us, to think about um, who we are as individuals, who we are as, as Buddhists. And you know, this is not the San Francisco Zen Center, this is, not, <clears throat> this is not Spirit Rock, this is not the Shambhala Center, this is the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. And so we've chosen to practice um, uh, in, this situ in this fellowship, um, one assumes, because we were attracted to something about the idea of being um, gay and Buddhist and, and what that could mean. So the gift of our practice is that we sit, we come together, we talk to each other, um, and we participate in engaged Buddhism. Uh, that's a very important aspect of, of what we do. Um, but one of the beautiful outcomes of all of that behavior um, is what was promised to us by the Buddha himself, which is that that our practice allows us to arouse present moment awareness. Who are we right now? Who is the real, the real me in this, in this present moment? Um, and so, you know, we don't sit meditation with a gaining mind. We don't practice Buddhism with a gaining mind. Um, uh, we do it because we can, because um, frankly, I don't know about you, but for me, I feel better. Um, and I was talking to my friend Juan the other day, and he suggested, and I think it was his line, um, but it's his now, um, that he practices Buddhism because it's practicing a better way to lead his life, a better way to lead his life. And, and I like that idea. Um, 
that Thich Nhat Hanh tells us that what he learned um, was that the meditative state that we just practiced for 30 minutes is actually our natural state. The natural state of our body and our body-mind is to be quiet, peaceful, engaged in healing, and at ease. Um, and, that's, um, and that's the natural state. And so then, of course, um, we have to interact with people, places, and things. Um, we have to leave the sanctuary here and go out into the world where there's traffic and jobs and retirements and all sorts of other things. Um, and so if we're in our natural state, which is why we often refer to meditation as coming home, coming home to me, coming home to you, coming home to you, it's this opportunity we have to be our authentic self, and that's a promise. So we don't come um, trying to tick off some goals or, or you know, I, I do meditation 10 times a week or five times a week and check, 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 I'm doing everything right. Um, in fact, Thich Nhat Hanh says that when we stop the discussion of things and begin to realize that the teaching is our own life, a moment comes when you realize then that your life is the path. So we don't have to, the books are great, the sutras are great, the rituals are great, the chants are great. <clears throat> they can all help us to deepen our practice, but in fact, it's deepen our practice. Our life is the path of practice. Um, the Buddha said a number of times during his teachings that um, you are Buddha. You know? Not I'm the Buddha and you're my disciples. Um, you are Buddha. By vow, you are Buddha. Um, and we have rituals in all of the major lineages where we confirm that. That by taking a vow, we become, we arouse bodhicitta, that mind of willingness to practice. Um, we take a bodhisattva vow in order to live the life um, that one would live if one wanted to be a Buddhist. Um, and in fact, um, as the Buddha taught us, we, we are indeed Buddha ourselves. So I think the other thing that I know we've talked about here a number of times, just the short, and I'll keep it really short, and somebody mentioned it yesterday actually, which is the beautiful, wonderful story of when Ananda was talking to the Buddha. Um, and Ananda was the Buddha's assistant um, and ultimately um, became the person that they called the keeper of the Dharma um, after the Buddha. Um, um, but Ananda was talking to the Buddha and he said, sitting with the assembly, he said, you know, Lord Buddha, I figured it out. Um, having good spiritual friends, Kalyanamita, having good spiritual friends is half of the path. And the Buddha, um, and, and Ananda was also known as the foil. He would say things that the Buddha could then teach from. So, so some of it was, you know, a little bit of a setup, I think, a little staging. Uh, <laughs> but, but so and, and the Buddha said, oh no, Ananda, um, good spiritual friends is not half the path, it is the entire path. So from the very beginning, we had the opportunity to say, hmm, we should gather in places. Meditation is an enormously personal thing, but I don't, and I don't know about you, but for me, I always enjoy meditating more if other people are around. I always feel more able to sit in, in meditative pose, in quiet, in calm, if, if I know um, that other people are in the room with me um, doing the same thing. And part of that's just you know, cognitive behavioral training. It's like I'm less likely to decide I need to look out the window or make sure my phone is nearby or whatever. If, um, and, and I'm not telling anybody, but someone mentioned coming in that they might have to make some body adjustments, and, and you might. And, and as I said, listen to your body. You should do that if you need to. Um, but what we know probably is that if I was sitting alone out there for 30 minutes, I'd be making all sorts of body adjustments, including walking out into the street to see who's going by. <laughs> so, so I think that, um, you know, as, as uh, Buddha said to Ananda, that having these good spiritual friends is a very vital part of our practice. Um, you all know that um, the, the famous quote from De Chardin who said, um, we think of ourselves as human beings trying to have a spiritual experience, but in fact we are spiritual beings trying to cope with this human experience that goes on around us. And so spiritual beings, you know, what, is, what does that really mean for us? What does it mean to be a spiritual being? And I think for me, and the reason I'm attracted to Buddhist practice, and particularly Gay Buddhist Fellowship, and the LGBT Sangha, and my meditation and recovery Sangha, fe fellowships that I practice with um, are fellowships where we have some common um, work to do, some common struggle, some common success. Um, so I think 
that for me, um, meditation being our natural state, um, I like to come together in fellowships where we have an opportunity to light the path for each other um, and, and see where we want to go from there. So <clears throat> if meditation is the gift that gives us this present moment awareness, right? Who are we in this moment? Um, then as we're in this season <clears throat> that we're in right now, um, and it is Gay Pride Month now, uh, LGBTQA Pride Month, um, I think what we should be celebrating today, um, and by celebrating, I mean opening up and enjoying and sharing with each other, um, is Gay Buddhist Fellowship Pride. So I have just declared um, from my throne um, <laughs> that today is GBF Pride Day. Um, wow. And it's, in, it's embedded in um, your, your San Francisco Gay Pride and, and, and other gay prides. Um, but I think, as I say, what that means to me is that if we're going to celebrate GDF, we need to know what it is and why we're here and, and what it is that we need to be celebrating. Um, and so I think, borrowing from the recovery world, we have an expression that says, um, the true work is to figure out who and what I have become, followed by taking the next right actions to be the person that I would like to be. Um, and so <clears throat> I think that that as we celebrate this holiday, we can do that individually, and we can do it for each other um, as a group. Um, we, can, we can really assess um, why we're in this fellowship, and what this fellowship offers to each of us, and what we offer to the fellowship. Um, you know, there's a lot of debating that you hear, and I'm guessing that some of you are approaching my stage of cranky old man, um, that you've probably been in some of the debates um, when you say the word pride, People of a certain um, um, timber say, I'm not going. It's too noisy. It's sponsored by a vodka company. It's out of my way. There's too many young people there. I'm made to feel invisible when I go. Why is it a party when it's supposed to be a revolution? Um, or it's trying to be all things for all people, and it just can't do it. Anybody heard any of those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the fact is that one of the things that's wonderful about our, this practice that we have of arousing mindful awareness so we return to authenticity is that we are made up of stories. If you've read, read any of David Loy's books, we are made up of stories. And the fact of the matter is um, that we get to decide which of those stories we're going to stick with. And so I've heard people say it started as a revolution, <clears throat> and then a couple weeks ago in the, in the BAR, there was an article by a woman who's been involved in, in organizing prior organizations here in other cities, it seems like forever, and what she said is it was never a revolution, um, and she seemed to be indicating, uh, if I was understanding it, but her story is interpreted by me for my story, is that she was saying basically from the beginning it was a celebration. And I think those two things aren't different. I think those two things are not different. I think we have been, um, as a people, made to be invisible, that we were um, illegal, that we were a pathology, that we um, you know, needed to be kept away from other uh, decent human beings, so to speak. And I think what happened um, at, at the bar here, um, where the trans folks um, first protested with the police, and at Christopher Street in New York and at other places around the country, was people said, no, no more. We're not going to be invisible. Um, and when they said that, and almost everybody back then was in the closet, um, or you were out when you were at the bars and in the closet with your family and your job and your church and everything else. So when people finally got to say, no, we will not be invisible, that just was this huge breath, just like the breathing that we do here, a huge breath from the center of who those people that our ancestors really were. And when they said, no more, you will not make us invisible, we will not be second-class citizens anymore. Um, a, a revolution did begin, um, and then when people took to the streets, and I was at the second march in, in Boston in 1971, um, and it was a ragtag group of us marching up um, uh, Charles Street. <laughs> it certainly did not look like a revolution. Um, <laughs> mostly people were headed for sporters at the bar on the other end. Um, but it was a party. It was a party because it's like, oh my God, two years ago, if you were going to sporters, you sort of cut over the hills so no one would see where you were going. Um, and now here we were walking in a group with flags and so forth. Um, and so I think it was a celebration and a revolution. 
And at the truest level, it was a very personal undertaking um, that each person had to decide how she, she or they were going to deal with this new phenomenon. How are they going to cope with and, and accept and expand on their authenticity? I am a lesbian. I am a gay man. I am bisexual or trans person or asexual. How are the people going to come to terms with, with those things? I was listening to a, a transgender activist on a, on a social media platform last week, uh, and she said that she wanted one thing for this gay pride season, and that one thing was she wanted people to stop using um, little quaint expressions like love is love, love equals love, or love for everyone. And she said what she wants um, was, this, she, she was a woman of color, and she said what she wants is for people to use the expression, um, we are living in real, present, and unrelenting danger. Um, real, present, and unrelenting danger. Because what's happened is that some of us, as we're debating whether or not we're going to go uh, put the appropriate sunscreen on and go outside next Sunday, um, or we're going to have a brunch at home and, and watch it on television, or ignore it. I, I put three people in the last two days say, we leave town every year on Friday, we just leave town. Um, and all of, that's, all of that's a choice, so that's good. But what she, what she was expressing in the social media was that um, for her, as a trans person, particularly young and a person of color, um, that there's very real danger out there. And we all know that. We've read the headlines. We don't need to um, really uh, take that apart. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, but she went on to point out that what some of us know is that there are 270 pieces of legislation floating around the United States in various state capitals um, designed to make transgender people and gay and lesbian people um, invisible, have less rights, be more restricted, and to roll back rights on everything from our capacity to have jobs and education in other places um, to our ability to, um, to uh, 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 marry and have children. There it was. Um, seeing as I have not done other one of those things, it just left my mind. Um, but what she's saying is that you know she didn't want for all of us to go into a funky depression for the next month. But what she said was one of the ways that we survive as human beings, um, which is one of the things our meditation practice helps us to undo, is that we survive by not paying attention to that which makes us uncomfortable, right? So if somebody said to you over lunch, and there were two of you sitting there, that what are we going to do about these 270 pieces of legislation, and they showed you the list, you'd probably have to respond to that, you'd probably take that on, and, and, and so forth. And she said that one of the ways that she keeps seeing people deal with what's going on is that we just, we say, love is love, let's let everybody be equal, everyone, you know, et cetera. And so she says that we can't really pay attention to that. And so for those of us who might, and I'm included, I will confess, um, that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about those 270 pieces of legislation. Um, and I got my start in our community as the chair of the Massachusetts Legislative Caucus. So, so I, I have um, evolved or devolved or something um, when it comes to, I've gotten old as well, got, and, and moved on to other things like coming here and talking to you. Um, but she pointed out, which I had not, um, uh, you know, I heard it once and forgot about it for two weeks, um, that, you know, um, in Idaho, um, they pulled over a van and at the Gay Pride celebration in Idaho, um, which, first of all, it's pretty remarkable just to hear that sentence, Gay Pride in Idaho, but that's, the world is, is changing. Um, but they pulled over a van and there were 31, 31 armed white supremacists in the van who were on their way to that Pride celebration. Um, so we, we ignore the current state of the world um, at, our, at our own peril. But I think for most of us, um, we, can, we can pay attention to being compassionate, engaged Buddhists. And what I mean by that is that we can start with taking care of ourselves and each other because, because that's important. The Buddha is, um, has, was quoted as saying, um, care of others begins and ends with care for yourself. Because you obviously can't be extending um, quality, compassion, quality, loving kindness um, if it's not coming from a place of authenticity and ease and love. Um, so I think that for us, there are ways that we can begin um, to practice that, that, um, that don't have to be um, uh, uh, something as formal as joining the revolution against those pieces of legislation or whatever. And we know in our community, that folks our ages, um, and there are several ages here and on the screen, but we know the result of being made invisible. 
Um, last Sunday, some of you, Saturday and Sunday, some of you were able to go to Golden Gate Park and see 3,500 panels from the quilt, AIDS Memorial Quilt, representing the 55,000 panels that exist, representing the million people who died of HIV because the government and the healthcare industry said, these people are invisible, these are gay people, we're not gonna spend money and time and effort on, on that. So we know what happens. So when she says, stop using the charming, non-offensive language um, and start saying, come on everybody, let's get engaged. Um, I think as Buddhists, um, that's, that's really an imperative for us. That's really an imperative. And as we celebrate Gay Buddhist Fellowship Day and Gay Pride Week or month, um, I think it's a, and a real opportunity for us to say, oh, what is this practice? On the cushion and when we're off the cushion. Valerie Brown, who's a senior Dharma teacher in the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition, um, has a wonderful article in which she says, how do we fight injustice without hating? How do we fight injustice without hating? And that's for some of us who have been involved in various political movements or social justice movements over time. Um, that's one of the things that happened is you just get exhausted. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine being completely socially and politically engaged for the last for the, during the four years of the previous administration without uh, being exhausted, and we're exhausted because our authentic selves as Buddhists are compassionate, living at ease, um, and, and living in peace and ease. And, and so suddenly, in order to do that work, you kind of have to be mad at those people that, are, that have been elected, and you know, if you're not careful, then you have to be mad at all the people who elected them, and then you have to be mad at all the people who live with the people that elected them and didn't stop them from voting. And pretty soon, you're mad at almost everybody, and you come to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship and you're looking around thinking, statistically, somebody in here voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in order to do the work, it can be really exhausting. It can be really exhausting. And so, what she says is that, you know, what, we're, what, what our Buddhist practice allows us to do um, is to notice. What we're supposed to do is notice. Notice what we're feeling. If the politics are rousing anger, um, then, you know, then do something different. If the politics are rousing defeat or frustration, then find a way to engage. And each of us has seeds of anger and frustration and fear and survival. And each of us has seeds of joy and hope and happiness and peace. And what happens is that what grows is whichever of those seeds we water. And so some people can work with anger. Some people can work with shame um, and find, it meaning, find meaningful ways to work with that. <clears throat> and if you're one of those people, that's great. Um, but if you're not, then find other ways to do it. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh also teaches us that you know, there is suffering. It's the first noble truth. We know that there is suffering. And so, uh, we should accept that. We should be really clear about that. Uh, he said at, uh, at, in one of his major teachings that suffering is not enough. Suffering is not enough to simply say, of course there's suffering in the world and there's a reason for suffering. Um, first of all, it's only the first two of the noble truths. The third and fourth one says, and there's a way out of suffering and here's the way to do it. Um, but what our practice allows us to do, and what we did here this morning for the first 30 minutes, and hopefully uh, many of us do on a, on a regular daily basis, is, is to sit and notice what's going on with us. Sit and notice um, who we are in this present moment, that, that beautiful present moment awareness. And then Thich Nhat Hanh says, when we get up from these chairs and cushions, um, we go into the world with the responsibility um, to create joy and beauty. And he says there's three ways that we can do that um, really easily. One is to observe beauty. Um, there's some flowers right there and right here. So if, you're, if your mind is already starting to twist up into a knot thinking about those pieces of legislation, take a look at that, at that flower arrangement or some of these beautiful statues or the sunshine that's coming through, hopefully still when we leave here, um, coming through the ceiling. Uh, second thing to do, which is which brings balance, which brings equanimity, uh, is to create beauty. Uh, and you can create beauty by arranging those flowers, or by you know um, any of the hobbies or, or uh, avocations or professions that you might have, um, writing poetry, um, writing a talk, doing whatever it is. Create some beauty in your life. Um, create some beauty in the life of your friends and family. And the third thing that you can do is to enact beauty. Uh, 
and to enact beauty is this wonderful opportunity that we have to just do something beautiful. Um, and I think that there's a number of ways um, that we get a chance to do that. Um, some of us will be political activists um, at some times in our life. Um, some of us will be donors or letter writers for certain campaigns. Um, some of us will be mentors or big brothers, big sisters for people in the community. All of those are, are wonderful ways to enact beauty, um, to counterbalance the other things that might be going on in life. Um, and then some of us um, can just be engaged Buddhists. And there are lots of ways to do that. Um, face to face, speaking to someone on the street who might be unhoused or disturbed. Um, uh, not giving money, I'm, sorry, I'm not advising that, and make your choice about that or food or whatever, but just being fully present. We talk a lot in these rooms about being fully present. Being fully present to someone you pass on the street. Um, you know, asking someone, you know, saying hello and asking them how they're doing, as long as you are willing to take a minute and listen to the answer, of course. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we can do, we know in the LGBT community, um, there is a, an epidemic since the beginning of COVID of loneliness and isolation among elders. So one of the ways that we can be engaged Buddhists um, and that we can change the balance of the world by spreading Buddhist love is to go where you know there are some elder folks, LGBTQ or other neighbors that you might have, um, and just knock on the door once in a while and make sure they're okay. Um, and I can give you my address if you need an elder. <laughs> if you need an elder to practice on, come on, come on over. Um, but the other thing that's going on in the world that that sort of behavior balances, mentoring younger LGBTQ folks, um, reaching out to elderly folks, um, being kind to each other, um, it's the idea of safety. And Larry Yang gave a little talk yesterday um, on, on Zoom, um, on video, and um, what he said is, one of the things that's interesting for him is that we all wander around fretting about safety. Anybody here? Wondering if you're safe in the street, if you're safe in your home, if you're safe from um, uh, people mani uh, manipulating you financially and digitally. And, mm, that just brought a thought up, but never mind. Um, um, and, so, and so one of the things Larry said is that how would it be if we just all had an agreement right now that we keep walking around wanting to be 100% safe? And how about if we just all had an agreement that the world is not 100% safe, never has been, um, and never will be? And so, what would it be like if we just leaned into that and said, what would it take to be safe enough? What would it take to be safe enough? And safe enough to go about the business of your job or your retirement or your schooling or your family life or your, or your single life, um, uh, your Buddhist practice, your other hobbies and, and social activities. What would it be like to be safe enough? And then, a teaching that I had gotten um, from, from a Buddhist teacher in Ireland, um, which is to stop several times a day and just say four words. Um, and he actually has his watch four times during the day. Um, I tried to do it with my 71, I couldn't figure out how to make it happen. Um, but four times during the day he stops and says four words, I'm all right right now. That's his meditation practice. I'm all right right now. And it's a way of saying the world is um, challenging and the world can be dangerous. And there are people out there who do not wish us well as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender folks. Um, and you know what? That's, we need to be present for ourselves and each other. We need to be aware. We need to celebrate our fellowship here in our community um, as places where we can be safe. Um, but you know what we don't need to do is we don't need to be um, going into the bunker and we don't need to be isolating and we don't need to be staying away from each other. So. We have this invitation in Buddhism, uh, and the invitation is to live with conviction and compassion. Um, this week, particularly, it's to live with pride, um, and always it's to live with authenticity. And that, that it just becomes a, a very um, important thing. And, and so we can mentor and share with each other how to do that. Um, I told a story yesterday, and I'll repeat it, sorry to those that were here. Um, but I was watching an old sketch comedy show on TV um, one day last week um, um, when I should have been sleeping, because that's what old people are supposed to do, but instead I was watching television. Um, and there were these two older folks on there, and they were in an apartment, uh, same apartment, and they would go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, wake up, and, 
Each morning, um, the two of them would wake up in the same apartment with the same surroundings, the same environment, the same sunshine coming through the window, and one of them would say, hallelujah, this is the day the Lord has given us. And the other one would roll over and look out the window and say, damn it, another day. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, the metaphor there is, of course, that, um, is that you know, we have this opportunity to say, what are we going to do with, with our lives, and, and how are we going to do it? And so the Gay Buddhist Fellowship um, that we're celebrating today on GBF um, Friday is, is how we do it. It's the fellowship. We each have had days that we were absolutely delighted by, days where we were frightened, probably some of us days when we've been ill recently and, and kind of across time, um, and days when we've been recovering. Um, and so we can help with each other. Um, there's almost no experience people here or on Zoom can have um, that one of the rest of us hasn't already had. And so if we learn the principle of dana, generosity, um, the giver, receiver, and the gift are the same, right? So if we learn that principle, then we ask for help. We ask for guidance. We ask for direction. How did it work for you? What did you do when this happened? Um, and that gives me the opportunity to learn a little something to perhaps, to perhaps um, save myself from some of the sharpest edges that I've been bumped into. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to give. So if I don't receive and don't, don't accept your help, then you don't have an opportunity to give it. So I think that you know, what we've been experiencing isn't a global crisis of uh, civil rights yet, although I think we could. But I think for those of us that gather here on Sundays and, and in other fellowships of, of gay and lesbian Buddhists, um, what we're looking at is what I think of as a spiritual fracture. Um, you know, the spiritual fracture is that, is that we know when we're sitting in here um, that life can be beautiful, that we are invited to live with peace, ease, and authenticity, and we're encouraged and demanded to share that with each other. Um, but then what happens is as we get busy um, when we leave here, or even for some of us as we're sitting here, um, we have this fracture, fracture from what could be to what is, um, and what we need is the glue to, um, to put that back together. And so I've been working with and working with my students about a three-part process to do that. And I call it connect, disconnect, and reconnect. Right? So those three pieces of the spiritual practice, the spiritual healing for me. The first one is connect. Um, and this is the process of connecting to my authentic self. Right? Since I was a little kid, um, my family told me who I should be. My schools told me how I should be. Um, jobs that I wanted told me um, how I had to behave. Um, basically be in the closet, be less of a sissy, be whatever. Um, uh, have certain political views versus others. I belong to a church that was very clear about what I could and couldn't do. Um, so the process was for me um, to, to be this version, and we've heard that expression, which I'm really uh, troubled by, when someone says, be the best version of yourself. It's like, no, be yourself. Be yourself. And so I think of this practice, um, some, almost everybody here is old enough to, to remember Lily Tomlin doing Ernestine, the, the teleprompter with it. She sat in front of that panel with all those wires. And I'm sure there's a 2002 thing that we could do digitally with that, but I'm not living 2002 digitally yet. So, but if you think of Ernestine, she used to have that. She was a switchboard operator. And there were all these things, and she would just say, nope, no, no, nope, not that one. She'd unplug someone, and someone would call and say something she didn't like, and she'd just let it go and drop it. So I think of it this way, is that we've, been, have, we've had our wires plugged in uh, by our parents, by our schools, by the government, by whoever. Um, and the first thing to do is reconnect with your authentic self. So sit at your switchboard and pull out all of those, uh, of those wires. Walt Whitman, um, most of you know, a wonderful poet, uh, and what he said was, re-examine all that you've been told in school or church or in any book and dismiss whatever insults your spirit. So this is the practice of dismissing whatever insults your spirit. So that's connecting, connecting with the authentic self. Um, you remember the Wizard of Oz, pull back the curtain and see who's really back there, right? So that's connecting with your original self. Um, and then disconnect is disconnecting from that wounded version. And it doesn't happen the first time we sit and, and do a renunciation practice. It doesn't happen the first time we talk to our teacher or our friend or our sponsor or our partner. 
um, but to truly and deeply disconnect from all those things that they taught us about who we should be and, and how a proper gay man or Muslim woman or an ally, uh, how, how people, um, trans folks above us, how we should behave. And, you know, we didn't just hear it, for those of us who we didn't just hear it from straight people and church people. We had really strong standards in our community about what made a good gay versus a bad gay or a gay gay versus a whatever the next letter was. Um, and so, so disconnect from all of that. So again, a process of figuring out who is that authentic self and then stripping away the cocoon that people encourage us to build around ourselves for protection. And then the third thing, of course, is reconnect with yourself, um, with each other, and with your fellowship. And to reconnect in a way that genuinely is um, authentic. And so this process, to me, is the process of healing that spiritual fraction. Um, and I think that one of the things that's really important about that is that it's our opportunity to use this Buddhist practice as a liberatory practice, as a practice that says, I'm not going to be who they want me to be. I'm going to be who I am, and I'm going to be that, filled with love for everybody else to be who they are. And I'm not going to ask you to be my kind of Buddhist, or you to be my kind of senior citizen in a few years, um, or for whatever, whatever happens. Um, I'm going to, I am going to genuinely be filled with joy for whoever, whoever it is that you might be. Part of the challenge, of course, is if you think of, if you remember when Eleanor Roosevelt said that nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know about any of you, but for decades, years and decades, um, I gave my permission. I wanted to fit in, I wanted to have jobs, I wanted to be engaged, I wanted to do whatever it was. And so I, sometimes without knowing it, sometimes knowing it, gave my permission. And what's happened for me through Buddhist spiritual practice of arousing mindful awareness um, and being in fellowship is that permission denied. I have taken back my permission, um, and no one can make me feel inferior. If I find myself in a situation where I'm feeling like damaged goods or inferior, I get to go back to the cushion. It's actually a chair at 71, but metaphorically to the cushion. Uh, if I get down in the cushion, you'll all have to help me back up afterwards. Um, but I get, to, I get to go back to the practice and say, no, permission denied, uh, I'm not gonna do that. So we've carried around these stories um, for a long, long time. I would get a few couple more minutes, right? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So I'll start to wrap up, because so you can ask some questions if you want. But we've carried these stories. I've carried mine for 70 years, and, and you know I knew what I could uh, talk about and not talk about. And so in order to get rid of those stories, that's the other piece where we do this together, is I need for you, my brothers and sisters, to be my fact checkers. Um, I need for you to help me figure out what parts of those stories are true, what parts of them are skillful, what parts of them are necessary. Uh, my Angela, the poet, said that there's no greater agony than to bearing an untold story inside yourself. And so we were all told, you know, the love that dare not speak its name. We were, we, many of us, if not everybody here, had occasions where even as a proud gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender person, you went to family or a work function or some other function and we're not gay or lesbian at that function. So we had those stories. Um, and I think that that's what the beauty of coming to fellowship is, is that we get the chance to say, hmm, let's try this again. Here's the story of who I am this year on Gay and Buddhist Fellowship Pride Day. Here's who I am. Um, and I get to offer that and to be that. Um, Bell Hooks, the poet, says that healing has, does not and has never happened in isolation, never that healing always happens in communion. Um, and we would say here that healing always happens in fellowship. And she teaches the same sort of thing that I was just talking about, except instead of saying fact checkers or whatever, she refers to those of us together in the room on, on this journey as enlightened witnesses. She says that we can be for each other enlightened witnesses. Um, and that that process is the process that helps us um, uh, to heal this fracture that we have in our community. So I think um, what I would like to say is that, um, you know, we have this beautiful gift, um, and the beautiful gift is you. You're a Buddha, and you're a Buddha, and you're a Buddha, and you're a Buddha. And so we have that, our authentic self. And in this fellowship, we have a safe place for a couple of hours a week to, to share it with each other. 
and to say whatever it is that's coming from truth. And you could show up next week and you have a different truth because things have shifted. And nobody here is going to say, oh, another story from this one. What people are going to say is, ah, there's been some growth, there's been some development, there's been some opportunity um, to arouse more mindful awareness. And so I think that this um, liberatory practice, if we want to celebrate, which was originally um, the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade, was the first time it happened. And even in Los Angeles, they called it Christopher Street West. Um, and it was about liberation. Um, and I think our practice here is about living with liberation and authenticity. Um, and so I think um, that what we celebrate, um, it could be a revolution. Um, if we genuinely live with peace, ease, and authenticity, liberation, and safety, that sounds pretty revolutionary to me. Um, and if we live that way, um, then I think for sure it's also a party and a celebration. So happy Pride, everybody. So we do have some time for questions um, that you could ask anything you'd like. And then we'd also, if there's some time, just, just if you'd like to comment, um, this is not, as I said earlier, uh, San Francisco Zen Center. This is not a Zen Center. Um, this is not a Theravada Center. This is not Spirit Rock. And it's not the Shambhala Center. Um, and so it is the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. So if you don't have a question, you might just reflect for all of us in the sense of Happy Gay Buddhist Fellowship Pride Day. Um, what brought you here in the first place? Um, and and why, you, why you keep coming back? What is it about GBF that brought you here? And what is it about this GBF that brought you here today? It brings you back. Any questions or thoughts about that? Here or on Zoom, I imagine? Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your talk. I uh, not only have been away from these meetings, but I've been away from Dharma talks. And it was just like this rush of beautiful warm water to get a Dharma talk. In fact, I was thinking how much I took Dharma talks for granted. When I come every week and I hear them, they'd be nice, I get something out of them. So I think to of them. Uh, and then uh, hearing your talk was just really extraordinary and beautiful. So thank you very much. Uh, I came here, uh, I first uh, uh, came out as gay in '71, and then I uh, learned about James Byers and Sangha in Berkeley and I went there and then I learned about this. It was a nice combination of my uh, spiritual and sexual orientation. And, uh, I really miss the fellowship. I'm always teary because um, I just remember everybody in this room. You know, I saw for years and years. And, uh, it's been a long time. Uh, I think I take, uh, I think I'm okay with my gayness and I don't have to really um, review it too much except for it. What, I really need to do is just come out as as the joyous me, you know, that doesn't really have to do with gayness really at all. But I've been so isolated and, and lonely because of this pandemic. I was isolated before, but the pandemic was like, you know, a real bang on top of it. So uh, I'm resolving now to not only uh, get out of uh, you know, to get more joy in my life, but to uh, work on getting, constantly getting out of the isolation. I started doing it this week. I actually went to the computer and I looked for a gay organization and blah, blah, blah. I was really doing homework on that. Uh, because I have, I have a couple of very primary friends and very few ancillary friends. I used to just have more friends than I know what to do with and, and something catastrophic has happened and I don't know why but I know how to solve it. And so I was really very, very happy to hear you talk today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have already recognize anybody who's here, so that's kind of strange too. But it's good to be here. So thanks. Welcome back. Other thoughts or questions or comments? Uh, Ditto, thank you for your wonderful talk. I uh, really appreciate your comment. Uh, talking about the transgender woman and uh, that basically we're in the clear and present danger 
you know, I don't think like that usually. Um, and uh, I used to work on work five a during the AIDS crisis, and, and there was the expression "silence equals death." And it took me a while to understand that, but it was really clear that uh, if we are not visible, that uh, we, we don't exist. We really don't exist. And um, it's just imperative. And, uh, I come here because uh, first my friends used to come here, and I heard about it. And, and then I immediately felt that uh, an affinity for this group because I was always, before that, sort of the lone gay person who liked to meditate. And I came here and I didn't have to teach or encourage anybody to meditate. They were already doing it. And uh, it was such a great group of, group of guys. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Stephen. Um, it, your talk brought up um, one of my work situations. Uh, I've done training in the past, and they say um, if you want to change your behavior, first you do something, and then afterward you realize you did it. Uh, and then you do the same thing, and you realize that you're doing it while you're doing it, but you're not able to change it. And then finally, you notice it while you're doing it, and you're able to stop. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a woman I deal with. I deal with accommodations for people at work for going through a process and hopefully coming up with accommodation for them. We have one woman who is a Palestinian and she has eye problems, she has hearing problems, she has anxiety problems, she has typing problems, and several other things. And every time I see an email come in from her on my inbox, I go, ugh. You know, because I know she's going to be paranoid, she's going to be angry, she's going to be demanding. Um, and I've gotten used to it, and over time I, I feel like I have been able to um, have some compassion for her, for her uh, to the point where my boss and I will be talking and she'll go, oh my god, I can't stand her. She's, and I'll say, she probably escaped across the, the river on parents' shoulders, you know, when the Israelis came in and were killing Palestinians, and she has so many, and my boss would say, oh, you know, that's probably true. <laughs> she has so many painful things she has to deal with. So, uh, do you have any, any thoughts about how one can learn living compassion with somebody like that? Because I say it, but I still get pissed off at her. <laughs> Well, I think, I think Thich Nhat Hanh says make friends with your anger, right? Because it's there, right? But I think you just shared with us um, one of the most beautiful prayers that I learned and that I use all the time is to simply say, what else is possible? Mm -hmm. And you just taught us a very good lesson of that. She probably had an experience that caused her. So if somebody comes up and gets in your face and is angry or whatever, um, or, you know, a friend was supposed to meet you for dinner at 7, and at quarter to 7 they call and say, I can't come. My first inclination is, that's an asshole, and I'm not inviting you to dinner anymore. Um, unless I say, what else is possible? Mm -hmm. And then we don't know what's going on with health these days, with, you know, I mean, his, his partner could have just broken up with him in a text message, or you know, who knows? I don't have to go, I don't have to do all those stories. But what I know is that my story is you stood me up within 10 minutes of the time we were supposed to meet. And if I can get, I can get very, um, you know, there's a, a teaching in sort of professional psychology that if you were abused as a child, you cannot tolerate disrespect as an adult. And it's whether the disrespect is real or imagined, you cannot tolerate disrespect. So if somebody stands me up for dinner, they've disrespected me, and I go into 70 years worth of stuff, if I can stop, take a couple of deep, good, cleansing Buddhist breaths and say, hmm, what else is possible? Then suddenly it doesn't become about me being disrespected, it becomes about that person and what they might be dealing with. And if I'm in a really good meta day, I can say, how can I help? Uh, I don't get that all the time. <laughs> I'm working on it. But I can at least get to what else is possible. You know, they, they didn't do that, you know, um, just, to, just to 
aggravate me or whatever. They, but something's probably going on, especially a woman, but you know, a human being who's who's frequently angry and nervous and frustrated. And, you know, that's not whatever they say to me. That's not about me. It's it's uh, it's how can I be present as a as an engaged Buddhist with love and compassion. Did you have something? Else? Um, I think Clint. Yeah, has exactly. the same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is perhaps like the last question we're going to be have time for. So Clint, you can introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, first of all, before I say what I'm going to say when I put my hand up, is, boy, you, you just hit the nail right on the head about having experienced abuse, abuse in the past, you know, really taking offense if you're not treated in a respectful manner. But I, I just so completely identify with that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, about 30 years ago, I was just getting exposed to Buddhism uh, for reasons we don't go into. And I was hanging out at the Green Gulf Zen Center. And uh, I loved it, it's beautiful, and I still have had a connection there. And uh, so people were very nice and very friendly, and I was trying to get used to it all. And they had like these little, you know, sessions where you, in a, you know, a group of people get together and just talk about a certain theme. And this session was Buddhism and sexuality. So I thought, huh, I'll, I'll try that out. And so I go in there, and there's like about, I don't know, maybe seven, people in there, plus myself, six, seven, and they, they talk about uh, sexuality, you know, in their marriage, you know, what, what, you know, without going into details, but I mean, like, what, what is working for them, what they have problems with, and I thought, well, I can't relate to this, and so I, I asked, um, what about uh, Buddhism and, um, you know, overnight sex, <laughs> losing, losing for sex. Uh, and uh, it was crickets. <laughs> um, yeah, casual sex is the term I was trying to think of. And, um, and then they just kind of like, you know, mumbled something and went on to the next subject. So I thought, these people are super nice, but, but this is not my, my community. And I, I heard that this new group called... Um, Gay Buddhist fraternity at that time, which was a horrible name. I, I just started about three weeks ago, and I joined it, and you know I've been here ever since. And it's just, and one more thing, and I'll uh, I'll end. I mean, I have been thinking about going to some kind of senior center where you, you know, just in case, my health is good, okay, but right now, but just in the future. And I heard of this one called Inso over in Healdsburg, where it's primarily Buddhist, though other people can join it too. I thought. Wow, that sounds wonderful. So I went up there, it's, and it's still being constructed, but Hillsburg is beautiful, and, and it sounded like it was a very great center. But then, then I thought, again, about what I said earlier, and others, I said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to be living with a bunch of very nice Buddhist heterosexuals, and I'm going to, the idea of spending the rest of my life in this place, in that environment, I, I know it would crush me eventually. So I, I'm, I um, just... I've decided, you know, I'm healthy, I'm okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go, go to some other place right now. And if I do, it certainly will be a place that has a strong gay presence. Um, and hopefully spiritual presence, too. So, it's you know, this has been a very important group for me. I, I think I might be the per 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 person who's been here the longest, but I've been like right up there. And I, and I really love to be the people here. Thank you, Clint. Thank you for you and all the other ancestors who have brought this group over these years um, so that we could all be here today. Um, and as the Buddha taught, um, we now are the Buddhas and ancestors who those people who come after us will be looking for. So, um, so we join the line of those of you who founded this group and kept it going. And, um, and uh, we all have our share of the work to do so that it will be here for people to come next week and, and next year. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, are there any announcements? Uh, I'm the host this week, so please stay, uh, join and stay in the fellowship of the Sangha. Uh, there are refreshments. Uh, if you drink water or tea, if you could put your cup or glass in the dishwasher. Um, I'll go around with the Donna Bowl uh, and accept contributions. As you know, Donna is the word for generosity in Pali. Uh, the range of suggested donations is ten to twenty dollars, and most of us have heard the what it goes for, the honorary for 
Stephen, the Rand, the monthly news, the Bible Street, which we haven't done for two years. We have a newsletter, which mostly goes to people in prison. Um, there's a sign-up sheet on Credenza if you want to be on our directory. And some members may still go to lunch after the meeting, uh, going outside at 1230. I would like to make a personal comment. I only come to the building here for Sangha uh, three or four times since we started doing that. Um, and I would encourage everybody to consider. I mean, I know it's easy to be at home in your pajamas or you know, to be wherever and be on Zoom, and it is different um, from having those good spiritual friends together with you. So do as I say, not as I'm necessarily done. <laughs> and, you know, I just encourage people to come once in a while or, or more if they can. Thank you. Um, I think Chris has an announcement from Zoom. Yeah. Um can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, um, the next two weeks are group discussion, and then after that will be two weeks of Anne Gly. Anne Gly spoke earlier this year. She's a professor, a associate professor of religion and cultural studies at the University of Central Florida. Anyway, she's going to give uh, one week on sort of the history of Buddhism, and then she's going to do another week. The next weekend she'll do sort of modern Buddhism. She's written a book called American Dharma, which you can get through the library. It's online in San Francisco. And also, she has two articles she's asking people to read before the different lectures and both talks. And those, I'll be post, those are posted on our website. Uh, the links for the articles to read are on that. I'll give another reminder when we get closer to the dates. Thank you, Chris. Um, any other announcements? Great. Um, so, uh, Steve, would you like to dedicate Mary to practice, or should I do it? You can do it. Okay, sounds good. So we'll uh, gather on a circle. Hey. By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness, which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity, without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month, and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.